We have another Slido question for you now, and this will be feeding into our next panel discussion. And please keep the comments uh, and your responses coming in. What is the most significant global challenge we face in providing food security for all by 2030? 30. Is it the population growth that we've been hearing about? Or is it the climate change and biodiversity crisis? We all know about that. Food loss and food waste? Consolidation of corporate power? Or conflict? Again, these are all themes that were brought up in our panel discussion. And we're going to be hearing more of them now with our second panel. And let me introduce our second panel to you. Dr. Usman Badian is Distinguished Fellow of the African Association of Agricultural Economists. He's a former winner of the Africa Food Prize, a member of the World Academy of Sciences, and he's the founder and executive director of Academia 2063, and we're looking forward to hearing about that. Uh, Osman joins us remotely. Also with us remotely, Fanula Gilsonen, who's Ireland's ambassador to South Africa at the moment, plenty of experience in Africa. We'll be hearing about that from her. David Butler is Director of the Sustainable Food Systems Ireland. That's a consortium of the Irish government's largest agri-food organisations. He's here with me. And Quiva de Barra is the Chief Executive of Throcra, the Irish charity that's challenging poverty and injustice in the developing world. And let's show our panel now what you thought in answer to our fourth Slido question. Do we have that up yet? I'll be bringing that to you in, in just a second. Usman, I want to go to you first while we're waiting for the results of that Slido poll to come in. Uh, Usman, you know, we've been hearing a lot about Ireland and, and our experience, but from your extensive experience, uh, Usman, if you're still with us, would you tell us what you want from Ireland this September and what you want from the EU? Thank you very much uh, for that question, and thank you for having me. Uh, I think um, what we would want to see the summit achieve, and that is what we would like to see uh, Ireland, the EU, and others uh, work towards making sure we get that outcome, uh, is that we indeed leave this summit with greater focus and attention to the challenges, uh, but also a greater uh, commitments and partnership uh, to meet uh, the goals that we all agreed to work towards. Uh, I hope that uh, Ireland, the EU, and other participants will make sure that we uh, come out with realistic ambitions uh, that allow us uh, to address the challenges on the ground, uh, and that we also come up with a uh, summit uh, that aligns with and supports uh, the agenda of African countries from the Agenda 2063 to the Malabo Declaration in Agriculture, which has a series of uh, the same goals, uh, but provide a framework uh, for local uh, um, uh, interventions, which uh, provides a framework for holding governments accountable, which provides a framework for including the private sector and civil society organizations. What is going to be very difficult, and why I hope that I and others pay attention, is that, that this should not become a summit of ideologies and uh, very strongly held convictions. It should be a summit rooted in evidence uh, that can guide action that has chances to succeed and can be scalable at the local level. It also be a summit that respects and reflects the diversity of the realities of the challenges of food systems. Yes, food systems have all the same segments, but the same segments have different ways and different challenges in different geographies. So not coming therefore with a prescriptive outcome and rather we share targets and goals and rules that will allow individual geographies to adjust those uh, to their own realities and make progress as we move forward. Thank you. So what's really, really key for you is, is, is that it's not a summit of ideologies and it comes up with solutions that are practical and locally applicable. Uh, talk to us about 2063, why that matters. Tell us what Academia 2063 is. All right, thank you very much. Academia 2063 is a... Uh, an international, in the sense of Africa-wide um, think tank, 
uh, with headquarters in Kigali and Rwanda and a regional uh, office in Dakar, Senegal. We are about 30 of us working across the continent. What makes us different is that we zero in on helping African countries to access the data and the analytics to successfully implement the vision of Agenda 2063, which is the Africa that we all want. Uh, it was in a 50-year period back in 2013 which goes, of course, first with ending the issue of hunger and poverty, but also transforming African economies and creating prosperity. As Tom was saying, it is government action, the quality of policies, that is much more determining than anything else. But getting the data and the analytics to support governments to improve their policies as they go forward is extremely important. We know and we hope that the summit will pay attention to that, that um, low productivity, in Africa's agriculture, in Africa's value chains, are a big driver of poverty and hunger. So looking for solutions, therefore, moving forward, we'll have to bring in several elements uh, that all could converge towards sustainable intensification. That's extremely important. Science and technology systems and innovations to bring out new technologies that can be adapted and adapted by the farmers. We need a whole focus on skills. Uh, driving a tractor is not like driving a bicycle. Uh, the processing sector, which is now the most important segment of Africa's food systems, requires the technology, the skills for process innovation, for product innovations. We talk about youth. They need the skills to gain fully engage in agriculture. Agriculture is a job, it's a profession that needs to be learned. So skills for youth is going to be extremely important. So I think that um, as we move towards uh, the summit's outcome, the journey in Africa and going back to Agenda 2063, a transformed Africa means Africa where rural spaces are livable. And that's where the summit can contribute as well. We focus a lot on productive assets, but social assets in the rural areas, access to social services, are important for productivity and for uh, gainful businesses. Access to infrastructure, we focus quite a lot, but are we doing enough in the rural areas? Until and unless the rural areas are livable for businesses and poor people and farmers, it's going to be extremely difficult to achieve advances in the food system. And I think that's a um, specificity of Africa that the Assembly needs to pay attention to. And we look at productivity as a driver of livelihoods to end chronic vulnerability and move the agenda forward. Fortunately, there have been some good movement in the last 20 years in Africa. We can build on that and hopefully that experience will transpire in the summit. Thank you. Thank you. And that's really interesting, that point about sustainable, sustainable intensification uh, that you raise, particularly in the context of the hunger challenge. And just to let you know what our audience watching panel think is the most significant global challenge in providing food security by all, for all by 2030 and by, by a large majority, 56 percent say it's climate change and the biodiversity crisis, population growth 15%, food loss and food waste 88%, consolidation of corporate power at 12%, conflict still quite low at 10%. And Quiva, maybe because again, the, given you know what we've heard about the, the challenge of population growth, the challenge of feeding that population uh, in Africa, and also at the same time meeting the climate change and biodiversity crisis. Um, what this man was saying about not going into the UN summit, you know, with an over ideological bias, but coming up with practical solutions. But it is an enormous challenge, isn't it, to sustainably meet the hunger and poverty crisis that exists and will grow, and at the same time, mind the environment. From your point of view, what are the key points Ireland should be bringing with us as we go into the summit in September? Thank you, Onya, and thank you very much to the previous speakers. I think actually a lot of the key factors have already been mentioned, but maybe I'll just underscore a few that I think are really fundamental. So one is the one that was mentioned by Michelle Winthrop, which is conflict. Um, 
the reality is that two thirds of the um, extreme poor will live in fragile and conflict affected states by 2030. So within 10 years, 66% of the people who are the furthest behind are living in contexts that are fragile. And that fragility is driven typically by conflict and climate change and often a combination of both. And also by unstable politics and governance crises or human rights violations issues. So I think what's really important is that we do treat this as a complex inter section of a, a range of different issues. But that is not to say that there are not solutions and that those solutions cannot be built from the bottom up. They definitely can. But I think one thing that hasn't maybe been mentioned before, so I'll just bring it into the table, is that we need to ground this in the reality of the lived reality of people where they are now and who are the most vulnerable. So the most vulnerable are not a homogenous group. You may have in some countries, in some contexts, the most vulnerable may be landless people, maybe people living in urban areas. It will always include women, it will always include young people, it will always include people living with disabilities, it will always include people who are suffering from chronic health conditions. But within that as well, you know, you need to look at the subgroups, which will include pregnant and lactating mothers, teenage girls, children, people living with HIV. So we need to just ground what we're talking about in the reality of that affect people who are affected by chronic or acute food insecurity are are, are suffering or are living through and then build the solutions up from there. So one way that I think is very useful to look at that is to say, okay, well, this has to be addressed through a human rights lens because otherwise you can quickly come to a position where you're talking about science, markets, food as a commodity, and actually forget that food is a right, food is a basic human right, and that many people really struggle in terms of their access to food. And their struggle could be as a result of their status in society, which leaves them marginalized and poor. It could be due to the fact that they don't have the assets that are required in order to help them either to produce food or to access food. So building it up means that a full systems approach looks at where is a person placed? Where are they in the community? What power do they have? What access and control over resources do they have? Where are the investments from government and from donors and from other institutions going? And are they actually targeting the needs of the most vulnerable? And this is an area where I do think Ireland can and should show leadership um, and speak maybe more strongly about, which is the practices that we have developed working in partnership with many governments over many years of focusing on well, what does it really mean to leave no one behind and to reach the furthest behind first? And then you will definitely reach a point where you're saying those who are furthest behind are the people who are most acutely affected by climate and conflict and extreme poverty. And then you will start talking about the things that scored very low on those lists, like conflict and also like social protection, which has a huge role to play in helping people to address chronic poverty. They scored so low. Were you surprised at that, Quiva, that they scored so low? I was very surprised, but I do think as well at the same time, we've got to understand that often when you answer these polls, you know, you're, you're, you're choosing between things that are indivisible and you're just trying to give some level of prioritisation. In fact, conflict, yes. chronic poverty, acute poverty, they, they, they're not indivisible. They mutually reinforce each other, often in negative downward spirals. Absolutely. And actually, in bearing that in mind, I'm going to give you another Slido poll question now. The Sustainable Development Goals 2, they aim to achieve zero hunger by 2030. And as Michelle was telling us earlier, we're way off uh, on that at the moment and nine harvests to go. So what is the most important factor, in your opinion, in securing a world free from hunger and malnutrition? Is it new technologies for agriculture? Is it support to primary producers? Is it climate change adaptation? Is it a global shift to healthy diets? Or is it zero food loss and waste? Um, I want to come to you now, Fanula, on the basis, of, as I say, ambassador to South Africa, but you've been working in Africa for many years now. So we heard from Moose Man about what he wants from countries like Ireland. What's your sense about how our relationship with Africa, with our notions of development and trade and food, how all that has been changing? Well, I think we're at a kind of a, a, an interesting point where many of the things that those of us have been engaged in development for many decades are seen now very much coming into the mainstream. So that's quite unusual, if you like, where people are talking about holistic food systems, they're talking about environmental, environmental, social and governance issues um, within that system and uh, emphasising the importance of all of those elements. 
Uh, so that's a real opportunity, I, I, I think. But what we have to remember is that at the centre of all of these systems are uh, primary producers, smallholder farmers, and uh, many of them, as Quiva mentioned, um, are women. And these people are very often the, the, the recipients, if you like, of various policies that seem to be the latest and best new thing. And when uh, we're talking about change, I don't think that we adequately consider the legacy of what's gone before and how that has to be unwound. Um, and as a result of that, we place huge burdens on farmers uh, to essentially take on a lot of the costs of the transformation that we now think is extremely important. And I think that that's, for me, a really key element. You know, we have to begin to see this from the perspective of primary producers and the communities that uh, that they live in. Because if we simply uh, talk about this as a, a theoretical transformation, uh, then we really risk creating further vulnerabilities for, for those people. So I think in this um, new uh, belief, I suppose, and or not, not belief, but in this new uh, embracing of the, the consequences of climate change and the, the, the need for us to, to respond to that rapidly, we need to put the resources in place for those that are going to actually experience this change at, at the, yeah. the grassroots level. So I think that that is an extremely important element of the way in which we approach this um, this phase of, of, our, of our policy development um, and engagement. I mean, I very much, I must say, agree with, with Usman on, on the issue of productivity, because what I've seen in Africa over many um, years is a, a tendency to um, open up new areas of land, um, but not actually increase productivity. And that is, is hugely detrimental from a climate change point of view, but it also doesn't help the primary producer because they're opening up new land to the same level of, of, of underproductivity. And that has, has an enormous effect then on the, the, the degree to which they can actually create a viable economic unit and, and a sustainable livelihood for, for them and, and, and for their families. So there are some of the issues that I think we need to be thinking about as we as we move into the, to, to the food uh, summit. I think they're terrifically important points. And, and, and David, based on, on your experience at Sustainable Food Systems Ireland, that challenge uh, that Usman and uh, Fanula were talking about there of sustainable intensification and the problem of low productivity, it's a circle to be squared, isn't it? It, it is, absolutely. Um, we see, though, that there's, that there's huge scope for increasing productivity by working in the systems, by trying to strengthen systems which are in turn supporting and working directly with farmers or farmer groups. You had the, we had the reference to cooperatives earlier. Uh, you know, so so it, providing tools, providing choices for farmers and for the people that work with farmers um, is part of what we try to do in, in our work, in, in, in working with our counterparts in, in Africa. And, and it's instance. also about, and again, going back to the point earlier from Owen about know-how and Fanula's point about, you know, being a bit aware of the legacy. It's not just about saying, this is what we know. It's, it, it's also about listening, isn't it? It's, it's, it's absolutely. We don't try to bring Irish models and, and impose them and say, this is, this is, this is what you must do. We say, we, we, we show people what we have done, what has worked in our context, and then say to them, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? And they respond, and typically they will interpret uh, uh, what we are doing, and it's our job as well to help them in that translation of what, 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 what it means for us in their context. And then we try to support them in, in strengthening their systems, um, maybe plugging some gaps. There may be specific technologies that are directly re relevant, but mostly it's about capability. Mostly it's about helping them fill the roles that they, they potentially could fill, but aren't right now. And just picking up on the theme of governance as well, th th this is why you know governance matters. It's about auditing the way that we are going about doing our business, isn't it? And making sure as transparently as, as possible, you know, we really are asking ourselves the right questions and not just thinking we're doing a good thing. Absolutely. 
we're demand driven. So, so, so we respond to the, to the requests and the questions we get directly from other governments, but also from agencies, from the UN agencies, and we work closely with our colleagues in DFA and Irish Aid. So we fit into their strategic priorities, um, but we, 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 we do seek to ensure that, that what we see as good practice is also applied in the execution. Uh, and 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 that 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 so so the objectives of of sustainably Im improving productivity of yeah. inclusivity of getting uh, uh, you know addressing the obstacles that women farmers face of getting youth in of improving skills transfer all of these kind of activities are what we're trying to trying to do in these kind of projects and it's complex and it's long term and it takes it it, it takes a long time to 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 change systems to change legacy systems where there's been perhaps a history of underinvestment. Yes, exactly. And I, I want to pick up now on, on a point about the climate crisis with you, Usman. Uh, I want to hear you talk to us about the experience, that point Fanula was making about it's important that, you know, in trying to, you know, feed the world and save the planet at the same time uh, from the effects of global warming, that we don't load too much on farmers and small producers in the front line and make them feel it's all falling down on them. So will you talk to me about those kinds of food producers in Africa and their experience of the climate crisis and how to help them deal with the problems of low productivity and the need to produce more, more sustainably. Thank you very much. Um, you know, um, we often focus on technology and access to technology like seeds and inputs. Those are extremely important, but I think we have to expand the basket a little bit. Uh, I happen to believe that unless the communities where the smallholder farmers live in the rural space and in fragile areas are made much more livable, it's going to be extremely difficult for farmers to be productive the way we want it. But let's start first with the inputs. Uh, the seeds that most farmers are using are not giving them enough returns in terms of yield. Uh, there's, uh, of course, across the continent, good progress over the last 20 years. Maybe that's where I should, should start from. Uh, the last 20 years were the longest sustained period of economic growth in agricultural performance in Africa. So there's a lot that, that, that went right. We can learn from that. Right? But from there, we know that better seed in the hands of farmers, uh, better uh, modern inputs like better fertilizers in the hands of farmers, uh, better advisory services, to use those in a way that is uh, in line with a sustainable environment and health for people and the communities and environment will give us the best outcome. If you invest in those while bringing social services and COVID has shown to us that the dearth of health infrastructure and health services can be a huge problem for many communities. So uh, we, actually have seen things working on the ground, and I hope we'll be really looking at that and trying to build on that. There are working seed systems, not in many countries, but they do, in some value chains like horticulture. You go across Africa, farmers are using modern seeds, modern fertilizers, modern inputs are producing, are competing in the global markets and exporting to Europe. So uh, it is possible to do that. Why are we struggling in the staple sectors? The way we did better uh, policies and institutional setup and science and technology. But until and unless a farmer can make a living from the land that they are cultivating now and feed their families, they will have always to compete with the environment around them. So by making them more productive, and that's why intensification and sustainable fashion is possible, we cannot give a general rule on how to do it. But if we focus on that and look at local realities, we can get farmers to intensify, use more modern inputs in a way that saves the environment, save biodiversity, and raise productivity for them. Thank you. 
It's really interesting the emphasis you're putting on seed there and also on, if you like, the social and health infrastructure in rural areas and how important that's going to be uh, to sustaining communities there. Uh, just to bring you the results of our final Slido poll uh, on the aim of achieving zero hunger by 2030 and what was mo most important to you watching us about all of that. Um, New technologies for agriculture, 6%, but it's pretty, it's fairly split actually, uh, one third, one third, one quarter. Support to primary producers that we've just been talking about, 30%. Climate change adaptation, 24%. And a global shift to healthy diets, 27%. It's fascinating to hear that issue, David, isn't it, of seed and be, you know, it, it's not the first thing that springs to mind, but obviously it's critical. We're working on a potato project in, in Kenya, uh, Onya, which is with, with funding from, from the embassy, uh, Embassy of Ireland. And um, a key point there, a potato, and uh, what they call the Irish potato in, in, in a lot of East Africa, uh, is a brilliant crop for, for in terms of nutrition, in terms of productive, uh, productive impact. Um, a key issue is the access to certified or improved seeds for, for small farmers, which improves then productivity, disease resistance and so on. And because there are new varieties coming along all the, and being bred all the time, I know this uh, well, absolutely. and they are much more disease resistant. They're the ones you want to grow. Absolutely, but you have, you have a couple of things. You have the, the behaviours, the access to, to, to seeds at the, at the farm level, you have knowledge and you have the institutional setup, and there are weaknesses in all of these. We're just a, we're just a part of this project. There are other partners and private sector in this, but the, but the whole point is a variety of actions which give access to improved seeds, to better uh, extension systems, so the advisory systems, things called farmer field schools, uh, access to better inputs, and we're working also with the National um, Inspectorate Service on trying to improve and, f and, and speed up uh, the pace of seed certification, which is a key bottleneck in, 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 in slowing down access in the market to, to improve seed. So exactly what Osman was yeah. saying. Uh, so, so a combination of things, private and public, trying to get that acting together. Uh, and, 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 the, and the proof is, is, is being shown through the yields that the farmers are getting, in some cases four times improved what they previously were getting, uh, better inputs, uh, more knowledge sharing going on and we have established a good relationship yes. between our Department of Agriculture and the, the, the Plant Health Inspectorate yes. with a view to working with them over an extended period of time in, in, you know, in addressing some of these bottlenecks. And Fanula and Quiva, you first Fanula. I was fascinated to hear Rosman talk about health and also social infrastructure as being so important uh, for rural communities because those were the same themes that we heard from rural communities here in Ireland talking about their sustainability as food producers, as fish producers and so on into the future. Um, and it, sometimes these things, Fanula, they tend to get overlooked, don't they? The importance of the human supports. Yeah, I mean, I think those of us who, who maybe grew up in, in rural Ireland know, um, you know, what a difference it makes if you live in a place that's that's remote and actually doesn't have services, even things as simple as, as transport services. And it really does affect uh, your quality of life. And of course, it's no different if you live in, in rural Africa. Um, health services, education services and so on are really important. So, you know, often while, while people kind of focus quite a lot on population growth, you know, in many African countries, and, and again, it's hard to generalize because the continent is so huge, but actually, you know, in many rural areas, actually the problem is underpopulation. You know, there aren't, um, you know, you don't have that critical mass of population that allows, um, for ad adequate social services and, and that's really required if, if rural um, communities are to flourish and if you're to put a stop to you know huge li labour migration into cities and um, because labour is so important um, for farming. But I also just wanted to circle back to that issue around seed and, and input because I think another really important issue is is the control of, of these inputs you know who controls yeah. the seed and I think in that potato project in, in Kenya you know, it's, it's looking at how do you maintain the control of seed uh, within the farming community rather than allowing it to be overly commercialised and, um, and to be removed then from, from the control of, of, of farmers or, or their cooperatives. And I think that that goes um, across the board for, for how 
uh, the broader governance and regulation of, of the agricultural sector and, and food systems um, operate because there is a tendency now towards a, an over concentration of ownership and control among yeah. um, certain corporations and, and that goes right through from production to distribution to consumption. So I think we have to be careful all the time not to confuse an increase in supply with uh, an increase in access to food. Uh, so making that differentiation is really at the heart of looking at regulation and governance and ensuring that control of these really critical uh, and strategic parts of the food system remains close to, to those who are actually primary producers. And that's part of the broader yeah. social infrastructure that's required in rural communities. And um, not that people should have to have money to buy seed, but they should have the, the ability to reproduce good quality and certifiable seed um, uh, and know how to do that and, and be able to maintain con control over it. So there are just some of the issues that I think maybe aren't always thought about when, when, when we're looking at, at some of these issues. And it comes back a little bit to what Quiva was saying around, you know, this isn't just a technical issue. You know, it's, it's also about, um, it's about rights and, and, and it's about control for communities um, over their food systems, over supply and over access. Thanks. That's a point really well made. And I know as man was saying he doesn't want, you know, people approaching the summit with ideological solutions. But that that argument about uh, the ownership of seed and access to seeds uh, certainly usually provokes uh, quite a heated political row. Um, I have a final question for you, uh, Quiva, that's come in for um, our audience. And we'll finish up on this. Beyond philanthropy. How can the expertise of Ireland's private sector be leveraged in the fight against poverty and hunger? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's an excellent question because certainly there is a huge degree of expertise in Ireland. And I think it's wonderful that we are seeing so much energy going into things like the National Task Team on Rural Africa. However, I would say that um, a word that Michelle used earlier really strikes me, which is the word humility which is also a trademark of Ireland's diplomacy. Like what Ireland, I've worked very closely with Irish diplomats for many years now in different countries in Africa. And what I've observed is that when Ireland is at the table, we're speaking with humility, but also authority. And the authority does come from the legitimacy of where we have come from, but it also comes from the fact that we're genuinely committed to partnership. However, at the same time, we recognize, and given our history, maybe this is no surprise, that policy around food security does not happen in a vacuum and that food security is inevitably strengthened when it's within a democratic context. So I think one of the things that Ireland needs to do, and that includes civil society, the private sector, and of course the government, is to ensure that in addressing these issues at the World Food Summit, that we are bringing those technical solutions that are appropriate to the table for people to look at and to see, okay, that could be interesting for us to learn from, but also that we continue to ensure that where challenge is required, that challenge happens. And I speak from personal experience of having seen the Irish government challenge when it was necessary to break the cycle of food insecurity in a context where the problem was not technological. It was certainly climatic, but actually it was a governance policy problem. And that's something that I would think that we should do well to bear in mind as well. While the summit should not be ideological, it should be focused on the rights of the poorest people and defending their rights and enabling their voice. It's fascinating stuff and in so many ways we've only scratched the surface but I really have appreciated you all uh, sharing your thoughts with the, us this afternoon and you at home uh, for joining in with your questions and comments and Slido responses. Quiva Usman, Fanula, David, thank you all so very much.